Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free CompTIA a certification training course on installing and configuring motherboards. I'm James Messer, and in this module, we're going to discuss the requirements from our CompTIA a 22702 Section 1.1, our practical application exam, where we need to install, configure, and maintain personal computer components. And our focus today is going to be on motherboards. How do we really install a motherboard? If you recall our 701 videos, we talked about the different kinds of motherboards. But once you buy one, you're ready to put it into your system, or maybe you need to replace a motherboard, what do you really need to look for? What are the things that we need to be aware of? Let's talk about what you need to know before you get into deciding what you're replacing or what you're adding to a system for this motherboard. If we start looking at motherboards, you'll notice that there are many, many, many different kinds of motherboards. Some of the motherboards you'll find may be based on particular features. Maybe you need to have very high speed access to data. Maybe for you, the speed of the CPU is the most important thing. You need to take into account how you'll be using this technology and exactly which part of the motherboard is really going to be the most important for you. Sometimes the size of the motherboard is important as well. You may have a case, and this case can only support a certain size of motherboard. We need to make sure that those things are synced up. Because it may be an ATX case, it may be a micro ATX case, it may be BTX. Maybe you need a certain motherboard, and you're going to have to buy a new case just for it to fit into. Sometimes cases will also support different sizes of motherboards based on where the different risers and connectors are. We'll talk about some of those in just a moment. There's also things you have to think about too. Smaller cases, because there are fans blowing air through those, sometimes those are louder than cases that are much larger where we don't have to blow the air through quite so quickly. So the different power requirements are something you should consider as well. Smaller cases generally can support smaller power supplies. They can't support the really big power supplies. So you sometimes you have to get a spreadsheet. You have to do a little bit of math, figure out how much you're putting inside of this computer, your power requirements, and then how much space all of these things is going to take, and put it all together to figure out exactly the motherboard that you're going to need. Let's dive into this a little bit and look at more details about exactly what motherboard we might want to select. As I mentioned, and as you've probably seen, a lot of different kinds of motherboards out there. If we're focusing on speed, you've got a lot of different options for processors. And it can almost be confusing with the AMD processors, the Intel processors. Every motherboard has supports a different kind of processor or a number of different kinds of processors. Some motherboards will support multiple processors. And you have to make sure that the operating system you're using and the applications of that operating system can take advantage of some of those capabilities. You don't want to buy a motherboard that supports two processors and pay all of the expense for the extra processors and find out the application you're using can't use two processors. It can only use one of those. may not be the most optimal. You also need to think about how much memory can a motherboard support, how many slots are available, and how much memory in the documentation of the motherboard does it say it can support. Some motherboards may be only able to support a maximum of 4 gigabytes of memory. Others may be able to support 64 gigabytes of memory. You need to make sure that the motherboard you're getting matches the needs that you have for your RAM. And lastly, what other options are available? A lot of these motherboards have a lot of different ports on them. You might have graphics capabilities that are built into the motherboard. You may want to get some with an extra capability so that you don't need to purchase a third-party graphics card to put in there. Maybe you'd like to get one that has certain types of audio or certain interfaces available. Maybe one has six USB ports. Another one might have 12 USB ports on the back of them. You need to look at that. You also need to see how many expansion slots are available if that's something you need to have in the future. When you start looking at cases, you also have a lot of different options available. You can go for the plain Jane gray white case where you just put everything in a blocky case. Some people like to have some that are look a little bit different or might fit into a different form factor. You might also want to consider something a little cooler, lights and neon and the big fans on the front, something that would be a real conversation piece. Some people will take cases and they'll modify them, have case mods, and they actually compete on how interesting their cases are for their computer. Well, the real thing to think about is the functionality, the speed, the, the amount of air going through there, and if you're able to expand on it in the future or if you need to expand on it in the future. Make sure the case you're getting is going to meet the requirements you have, not just now, but also looking forward.
So now we've purchased a motherboard, we've got a case. What should we do before we actually install the motherboard into the computer? I have a server that I used here. It was very good to use this one for this particular course that I put together because it's a server that has a very flat, so I can open up the top and you can really see everything inside of it. Notice that my power supply is in here. I've got fans in here. There's wires going everywhere to all kinds of things and power connections. What are all these things used for? And how do I fit my motherboard into this piece? Well, we need to think about a few things. We need to make sure our motherboard itself is ready to go into our computer. So before we even get to a point where we're screwing it into the case, we need to make sure that we're installing the processors and the heat sinks and the fans and our memory, everything that we would need so that we can simply put the motherboard right down and it will be configured exactly the way we'd like. Generally, we'd go through our motherboard documentation and make sure that all of these things are in the right place and that we've put them exactly where they need to go. We also need to look at the case itself. Some case, there are standouts in the case where you're actually putting the motherboard right on top of those. Those have become pretty important. We'll look at those in just a moment. But some cases, you have to install the standouts yourself. Not all cases come with the standouts all ready to go. So look at your documentation for your motherboard. And if it says if you have a BTX motherboard, put these standouts in this location in the case, you'll be just fine when you're ready to install the motherboard itself. Here's our motherboard. We're going to now add the processors and the memory and the other components we need onto this. You'll notice this motherboard is one that has dual processors. There's two slots for processors. You can see that these are zero insertion force sockets that are on the motherboard. You can see the big handle that's up here, the sil silver handle. It's called zero insertion force because I simply place the processor right on top of it, and it simply installs by pushing that particular arm down flat with the processor socket on the motherboard. So I don't have to push. I don't have to damage any of these sensitive components to do that. It uses a package on the processor itself called PGA package, a pin grid array. You can see all these little holes here. Those are the little arrays of pins that come off the bottom of your processor. So what we'll do is simply place the processor into these sockets and we'll simply push down on our little silver arm here and it locks the processor into place. So we didn't have to damage anything by pushing hard on the motherboard. That's great. Now these processors get very, very hot. And so for this particular motherboard, they recommend that, especially for this processor, they recommend putting a heat sink and a fan right on top of those. And we know that we're going to need to make a good connection between this processor and the heat sink itself. So we're going to get some thermal grease. Usually those come with the heat sinks. If you are reusing heat sinks, you want to be sure you get some thermal grease and put it on the top of this processor. And then add on the fans and the heat sinks, and then put the, the heat sink and the fan right on top of that heat sink. The, the fans are designed with the heat sink. They often come as one piece, and they'll fit right on top and slide there. There are uh, these connections on the, the, the sockets themselves on the motherboard that lock down the heat sink, so it's not going to go anywhere. And then the fans themselves get power by these power connections that are also built right into the motherboard. So the motherboard knows that if you're putting these processors on, you're going to need these fans to go with it. And so they've already added the power right onto the motherboard. It makes it very, very easy to get these cooled directly right on top of those heat sinks. Also notice that we've slid in our memory into this. We've made sure in this particular motherboard, the memory slides in at an angle. We have another video that talks about the installation of memory. So you want to be sure you put those in the right way. And in that other video, we show you exactly how to do that. And there's another video on troubleshooting that if you run into problems. But now we've got this motherboard ready to go. We're ready to put the motherboard into the case itself. Some things you should always think about is that sometimes this is a little bit difficult. You may actually have to remove things from the case, remove the power supply, remove the hard drives that you might have in there because it's kind of a tight quarter to get everything in there. It's very, very difficult on some cases to be able to get this motherboard in there. You also have to think about your standouts. Make sure that you have put those standouts in there. Your motherboard should never sit flat against anything. There are a lot of different components there, and it's very, very easy to short out the different components or to create some unintended shorts between devices if you aren't using those standouts. You also want to be sure you're not bending things. I know it's a very tight in some of these motherboards, but these are very, very sensitive, and especially sensitive to bending. You don't want any of the, 
the, the soldering that's on that device to ever pop at all. You want it to be very careful and handle it with kid gloves and make sure you're not bending the motherboard as you put it in. If you look very, very closely at your case, you may find these little standouts. Here's what they look like. Uh, they may be plastic or they may be metal, as in this particular case. And the idea is that it keeps the motherboard up above the actual case itself. The motherboard is actually sitting on a number of these different standouts to make sure that it's not going to be touched by anything else. And your airflow is also going to go on both sides of the motherboard. But the real key here is that the motherboard isn't shorting itself out. Imagine if I was just putting this motherboard right on top of this metal case, you would have massive problems because there's so many components on the back of those motherboards that would then be electrically connected that should not be electrically connected. So that's what those standouts are for. Now we simply take the screws that came with those standouts in our motherboard case and we screw them in. You'll notice that the screws themselves are also grounded from everything else. They have metal around them going right into those standoffs. And that way, they are completely isolated from anything else that's on the motherboard. Again, making sure that we're not going to create any problems with the different components on this motherboard being able to connect to any others inadvertently. Once we have the motherboard in place, we're not quite done. You remember all those cables that we had? They were everywhere on this motherboard. We want to be sure that we're able to connect all those wires up to where they go. Because there's lights and there's buttons on your case. There's maybe ports that need to be extended off your motherboard. There's all kinds of different connections. You want to be able to plug in your keyboard and your monitor. And once everything is, all your wires are connected and all your power, plug it in before putting the case back on it before putting the top on that case. Plug it in, and let's see what happens. There's also some troubleshooting you could do with some postcards. We'll talk more about that in our troubleshooting video. You'll notice all those wires, if you look very closely, probably have writing on them. This is really the only way you'd ever be able to keep track of all of this. It may have the reset switch. Here's the hard drive light and the power LED. So there are going to be options and connections on your motherboard that are well marked for these particular things, or they'll certainly be documented in your motherboard documentation. And you'll probably see them. For instance, here's the power connection. Here's the power LED. That's where that one plugs in. Here's the hard drive light, NIC1, NIC2. You've got other buttons for the X, the reset, the power. You've got the blower fan and the chassis fan. So these are pretty well marked on the motherboard. You should be able to tell exactly where these things plug in and make sure that that light is going to be able to turn on on the front of your case because that light plugs in right here for instance, where the hard drive is. You'll be able to see the hard drive light flicker right in the front. So just plug them in. Just make sure you've got them all in the right place. They're named properly. The power LED goes right there. You may also have different connections for other components. If your case has a speaker on it, you may have to take the wire for the speaker and plug it into the speaker connection that's on the motherboard as well. So they may not all be in one place. They may be in different places on your motherboard. Just make sure every wire is accounted for and that you're plugging into all of the different places on the motherboard. The power itself may be the easiest one to connect to because it is a big connector that we're taking directly from our power and we're plugging into on our motherboard. Just make sure you're plugging that in in the right place with the right connectivity, and you'll be in great shape for the main power coming from your power supply. And this is the big connection going in to the main part of your motherboard. Let's see what we can remember now about installing and configuring motherboards. Our first question is, what prevents the motherboard from shorting onto the metal case? If you recall, we did not have to install any on my motherboard case, but you may have found in your case that you had to put standoffs in place to make sure that that motherboard does not sit directly on any type of metal. The next question is, what is the size of the case based on? Well, if we're buying a case, we need to make sure that that case matches the motherboard type and size that we're going to be putting inside of it. Those two have to match up, or we're going to be in trouble when we're trying to put that motherboard in. And the last question is, what tool is absolutely necessary to install a motherboard? What are we absolutely going to have to have? And you saw there was really only one tool that I used to put that motherboard in, and that was just a screwdriver. If we're doing any type of troubleshooting of power to the motherboard, you might also use a multimeter too. And if you refer to our, our video that we have on troubleshooting the motherboard installation, we make extensive use of that multimeter. Well, that covers what we needed to know for our CompTIA A plus 22702 Practical Application Exam, Section 1.1, where we needed to know how to install, configure, and make sure we can get those motherboards up and running. If you'd like to see any of our free A plus videos, you'd like to participate in our message boards and much more, you can visit our website at freeaplus.com.